back again. We're still at verse 20. And we're getting ready to go into verse 21, but in order to lead into that, I have to do some backstory. Verse 20 starts at C693, so it's 723. And this whole period is covering Leo and his son Constantine. Okay? Having set it up here, when Constantine is crowned at the ripe old age of two. Now, because that happens, the question is, why is God saying that unless the Lord cut those days short, no human life will be saved? What does that have to do with Leo? I understand what it has to do with tribulation. What does it have to do with Leo? Leo is therefore being expressed as a prototype of what the tribulation will be like by means of setting up the association between the actual historical period because of the syllable counts and the doctrine of the tribulation in other words you know if you're going to be in the tribulation it'd be really helpful if you are as informed as much as possible about what it's like okay because it could seem nice and in fact the first three years of the tribulation are going to seem very nice so you need you need like how are you going to know that it's actually the tribulation okay if it's nice you know not everybody's glued to their tv sets you could be out in the forest you could be you know on the road in this day and age, that's kind of hard to imagine, but, you know, a lot of people live very isolated lives. How are they going to know? Okay. The Bible's telling you how to know. It's, it's paralleling the future actual tribulation with a period that to us is past, but was also future at the time Mark wrote. That period is 732 to 734 A.D. for the word... Curios in particular, but it spans the period from 723 all the way to 746. You see how I got that? So from 723 to 746, it's tribulation quality, but it's lasting for a whole lot longer. And unless those days, whatever days they will be, were cut short, everybody was going to die. Well, that's a pretty dramatic thing to say. How do we know how true that was? Well, let's look at what time it was. 732 A.D. to 734 A.D. is the span of the time for Curios. And it's kind of important if we want to look there first. Okay. Well, what was that? Well, well, well. In 732 in the West, specifically between France and Spain, which is where I come from, in the Pyrenees, genetically. Okay, I was born here. So were my centuries of my ancestors going back to before the founding of the United States. Okay, Battle of Tours was 732 at the borderline between, nearly the borderline between France and Spain. What was that battle about? Well, the Arabs, after Muhammad died, his last speech, which they won't tell you in English, was, I want you to go up to Jerusalem and take it over. Kill the Jews. Okay. So he dies, and they do that. And they not only do that, but they spread all along the underbelly of Europe called North Africa. And they come up from the other end of it, in the west, go through the Strait of Gibraltar and enter Spain. And they take over Spain. And they're pushing north, pushing north. And by the time they get to the borderline between Spain and France, there's a guy named Charles the Hammer, a.k.a. Charles Martel waiting for them. And they fight, and it wasn't just one battle. 
And they fight, and they fight, and they fight, and they finally get defeated enough in 732 that they don't want to try and invade France anymore. Now, why was that important? Because all the monasteries and most of the Bibles were in France. That was where everybody was most interested in Bible. There was a sort of, uh, you know, it was France, it was Germany, it was Italy, it was Britain, and they go back and forth and how interested they are, but their interest kind of was stable. If the Arabs had gotten in there, what they do is if you're Christian or Jewish, you're untermenschen. And you gotta pay a head tax, and anything you do, if an Arab doesn't like you, and he kills you, or he maims you, or he steals everything you got, you got no recourse. Even though you have to pay a tax, you got no recourse under the law. And they don't like your Bible, so they destroy them. They don't like you, so they destroy you. Every dollar you make, they take. That's what life in Arab countries is like. And especially then, in the beginning. They got sophisticated later. But in the beginning, they were just animals. Alright? So the Battle of Tours is what preserved your ability to get Bible and basically preserve Europe. That's how important it was. And talk to anybody you want to know about the importance of the Battle of Tours. That was 732. Similarly, in the East, the Arabs who had taken over Jerusalem started moving north and north and north. And now they're running into Byzantine territory. And in 740, our boy Leo stopped the Arabs the way Charles Martel had stopped them in Spain. So Leo kept him back, and the, the, I don't remember exactly all of how he did it, but he did it so well that they just didn't want to invade after that. So he cut their days in his land short. So that's why this is so cute to portray, kind of like an epitaph, what was the importance of Leo III in God's eyes? That's pretty important. Because there are more Bibles in Byzantine Empire. There are more Hebrew Hebrew texts, okay, because, you know, it's including Jerusalem and all that. And there are more Greek texts. In the West, what they basically had were Latin texts. They had the Greek texts, but they were all chained up. And even the Latin texts, you had to, like, have a billion dollars in order to get one. So most people, if they want a Bible, what they do is they become a nun, or a monk, or a slave girl, you know, washerwoman, to a monk or a nun, so that they can at least glimpse the Bible and hear it chanted at meals. It was really, really hard to get scripture in those days. You were lucky if you saw, like, part of the Gospel of John. Or you saw part of a psalm book. They, they cut up the Bible in little books. Alright. They cut it up. So having a full Bible wasn't. It was just starting to become desirable at this point. So that's why the Arabs are coming up so prevented from happening. Okay. Satan always rolls out the Arabs. Every 430 years. 638, 7, uh, 1071... 1517-1941 you can call it 47 if you want both are true and 120 years then in, in, you know elapses and then the Arabs go back under the floorboards like the, the cockroaches that they are and I don't mean all Arabs I mean the Arab Muslims they're cockroaches total utter cockroaches and the rich ones, of course, are a little more refined. But they're funding the cockroaches who actually do the jihads and the terrorism and all that crap. Alright? The Arabs have always been like that. Christ predicted that. Or Moses, you know, wrote about how God told, you know, Hagar, mother of one of the half of the, all the Arab troops, your kid Ishmael is going to be a wild donkey of a man. Yeah, the, that's them. They gotta argue over everything, they gotta fight over everything. If they don't have an external enemy, they'll fight themselves. And I heard that myself from the State Department in a lecture 
in college. My professor was real on good terms with the State Department, and so they came and gave us a little lecture about the Arabs, because we were in the middle of the, the Yom Kippur War at the time. Okay? So, 740, he stopped the Arabs. That's a big deal. You wouldn't have your Bible, maybe, likely, if you didn't stop them. Okay, so he cut their days short in his land, and therefore the flesh is saved. Yeah, how can you be saved if you don't have a Bible to know what the gospel is? So then your flesh is useless. See the point? It's really cute wordplay. You see it? Alright. Now, our boy doesn't live much after that. His purpose is over. Okay. So, this is really biting. This stands for 746 A.D. Okay, so watch. 46, 45, 44, 43, 42, 41. At the beginning of saved, Leo dies. The year after he stopped the Arabs, his purpose is done. So now he goes home to heaven and he's saved. Isn't that cute? See, once the meter is right, it's like all these little biting things come into play once you know the history. And I didn't know the history. But you see how it plays now? Now you're going to have your own fun with this, I'm sure. But see, here's the link you can look up with Constantine. Here's the link you can look up with Leo. I'm sure there are other books that you can find to read them. But that's how our story of the Nexus time, the day of the Lord, as it were, the centerpiece of history for Byzant Byzantium. That's how it opens. Stopping the Arabs. Cutting their days short, else no flesh would have been saved. And then he dies, his purpose done, and he's saved, dying right here. Is that cute or what? Alright, this is where we stopped. Leo the third died right here, very punny. Okay. He's followed, of course, by Constantine the Fifth, who's a lot like his dad. A little little um what do you want to call it? More um maybe charismatic. Okay. And the thing that's neat about this guy, who lives until seven seventy five which is right here. That's really cute. Okay. So he's starting here at Esoste. 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 I can't ever say that right. Esoste. Esoste. See that little mark that's going up? That little accent mark going up? That's what your voice is supposed to do. Or actually that's where, the, when you say the word O, you, you, you're supposed to say the word oh so that the sound ends at the top of the roof of your mouth. It's uh, in Mandarin is close. It's called second tone in Mandarin. So it's so it, it, it It's not necessarily that your voice goes up. It's that the, the sound of the O oh goes up to the roof of your mouth. It's so I, I can't do it right. Maybe I'm not Greek. Um, and then his life ends at Tis, that's 775, and that's going to end up being really, really important, okay, for what happens, because the, the, the satire here is just biting, and complimentary, too. So, our boy Leo III dies here, 741, he saved, and he saved um, Byzantium. So, the, the text here is really very witty, you know, if the Lord hadn't cut all those days short, no flesh would have survived. Yeah, he stopped the Arabs. The Arabs are really bad, okay? Their, their history is being whitewashed by everybody. Mostly because of, well, I'm not really sure why, but it wouldn't hurt to speculate that it's due to fear because there's like two billion Muslims. But the Arabs are really, really bad, okay? They all talk about all oh, the golden age of the Arabs and all oh, we were living in peace with the with the Jews and the Christians. That's not true. What happened was is the Arabs came in roughly and brutally into an area 
and then after they got there they were changed by the culture that had that they replaced so the culture ended up finally winning over them and they civilized as a result of the culture that was there that they replaced that's what happened especially in Spain okay so to stop the Arabs from taking over was really important because this is where you know the bulk of the Bibles were so that's why this language is so important and this is something I want to stress just like Matthew uses the word kurios to depict people who are pro-Bible reforming it, translating it, finding manuscripts you'll notice how bald he's treating this and if you know Psalm 138 too you'll understand why he's putting the word above his own name if his word, and this, this is something I'm not learning as well as I need to wherever his word resides no matter how small, how ugly, how bad the location or the person in which it resides, his word is there, so he is there. Get that straight. This is your greatest and strongest way of knowing that God will protect you. If his word is in you, he's there. And he honors it. So you can be the worst person in town, and a lot of teachers are. I don't mean to single out the teachers, because in a way they've got the worst job on earth. But wherever his word is, he is. Now God is om omnipresent, okay? He's technically speaking everywhere. But you can be in a room and be thinking about something else as if you're not even in the room. Have you ever sat at a bus station, or in a car, and yeah you're physically in the car but your mind is a million miles away okay so you are there and yet you're not there where his word is he wants to be there and his word was in Byzantium, Byzantium actually in many cases more than it was in the West because the West was using a Latin translation for the most part I mean 99.9% .9 of the West was using the Latin they weren't really using the word they had, for the most part, you know, off and on again, but mostly, they didn't like the Jews. And so the Jews had to move successively westward, eastward, and southward. And then they ended up running into the Arabs. So they often would cut deals with the Arabs in order to just be able to keep their own life. Okay, so Byzantium ended up becoming something of a um, protection area for Jews. Okay, so now the manuscripts, the Bible, the Lord, therefore, is present there. And had the Lord not cut those days short, no flesh would survive. Yeah, because if his word isn't out there, then where's the juridical reason for him to be in it? It's a, it's a, it's a profound doctrine that, that I keep on forgetting because I'm thinking, well, I'm benefiting from the word. And yeah, it's in me and I love it. But you're not benefiting from me. And his answer is, look, you got my word in you. I mean, he does love me anyhow. But I keep answering him, well, you shouldn't. Well, but now here's why he should. His word is in my head. I can't tell you how important that is to survival. And that's exactly what he's saying, is that the survival, the thing that saves... Esote, is the fact that the word is there and all the more so because the guy in this case Leo the third dying at just between the E and the S Leo the third was adamant about getting back to the Bible so now his son Sote <laughs> Pasa Sarx his son is now going to be saving all the flesh in Byzantium too because his son Constantine the fifth right here is next and he too like his dad is a reformer but he doesn't he doesn't want to just force them to stop worshiping icons and get back to the Bible he wants to reason it out so by 754 okay that's nine years after this okay so let's count nine years a la dia tus eclectus us 
Okay, Allah, but dia because of. It's, it can also mean through. Tus, that's how we know it's because of. Because this is an accusative case. The O-U-S ending is your tip off to accusatives, generally speaking in Greek. Okay, so dia tus eclectus. Because of the elect. See, tus. If you got if you got an accusative, that's the definite article. The sometimes used as a pronoun on its own. And then eclectus, the elect. Now who are the elect? Anybody who believes in Christ. Okay? God elected to make a rule. Anybody who believes in Christ is saved. Okay, so once you believe that rule, once you believe it, you are saved. And you are elected in Him. It's a major theme of the New Testament. Calvinists get it backwards, but that's the way it goes. Okay? Us. Another accusative. Tus eclectus us. Who? This is Greek word hos. That's the accusative plural. Okay? And it because of dia. Alright? Exelexato. The ones who... See, these are the... This is so cute. The, the elect who are elected. Okay? And the elect has this connotation of... Like, think of a bowl of Skittles. You stick your hand in the bowl and you're taking out a handful of Skittles. The Skittles you're taking out of the bowl are the ones you elect to take. It's that kind of election. Okay, or if you don't like Skittles, think of M&M's or peanuts or whatever is your favorite food. You're electing to take that handful of those peanuts, of those Skittles, of those M&M's. Election is the, is the idea of grabbing something you want and taking it out of a bunch of others you could take but you don't choose to. It's real important. So it means to grab and take out of from a group only certain ones. Okay? And then here we go. Ecolobos then. Cut short. Tas Himeras. Okay, so translate from the beginning. Allah, but, dia, because of, tus, the, electus, elect, us, who, ex elexato, are elected. Ecolobosin, he cut short, tas, the, hemeras. Now you'll notice this is the, and this is the. But the word hemera, if you know any foreign language at all, you know there are female word, female gender words, and male gender words. Hemera is a female gender word, means day. Okay, so it takes a female gender. In this case, it's um, genitive. I think it's genitive. I don't bother to learn the case endings except in Bible work. Let's have a look. Uh, twenty. What is this? Mark thirteen twenty. I don't know, Mark 13, 20. Let's have a look at what it is. See, that's accusative male. Feminine plural. Ah, it's accusative. See, I'm wrong. It's not genitive, it's accusative. I used to learn the old-fashioned way where you learn conjugations and you learn case endings and stuff like that when I was in school. You know, that's how I learned Latin. Okay, well, it's much easier to use Bible works. Okay, so gemeras, that's accusative, plural, alright, so tas has to be accusative, plural, because it's the definite article going with it, alright, so, that takes us to 769, and that's where change occurs, in 769, Constantine V, now ruling, he, he, uh, um, how do you want to put this? He married the first gal and had had a son that we're going to find out about named Leo the fourth. He's down here. And then she died. And then he married another gal and she didn't have any kids and she died. And so he married a third gal named Eudokia, which is really hysterical considering 
um, Paul uses that as part of his anaphora in Ephesians 1 and it, 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 it it's usually translated some like good pleasure okay um, well thought of well spoken of well considered in other words people would look at her and say oh you do Kia in other words they're expressing their approval okay so he married her she had five kids <laughs> okay so here in 769 what happens was Leo of the first wife Leo the fourth right here he's already he's already been crowned okay as a you know successor to Constantine the, the fifth he's already been crowned and they're practicing the ancient he you know Egyptian practice of you name yourself after somebody famous and then you alter the name with the somebody else that's famous that's in your family and you go back and forth so it's like Constantine the fifth then it's Leo the fourth because it was Leo the third is his grandfather I hate that system because it's so confusing I'm getting everybody confused as to which Constantine and which Leo but you know they thought it was majestic and respectful 769 poor old Leo <laughs> now has five five uh, four brothers and one sister from Constantine the fifth his dad his third wife that's always problem okay wait a minute <coughs> sorry I have a lot of allergies okay so in 769 what happens is um, Constantine V's third wife is finally crowned Augustus I don't know why it took so long but she was and all of her kids therefore get little posts that say you know if Leo the fourth dies because he was always supposed to be first if Leo the fourth dies well they have the you know he set up an order of succession but the kids you know being of another mother age-old story right the kids being of another mother they're not too happy with the fact that the, the firstborn son is gonna inherit they, they want they want they want they want okay so there's a little conflict that starts right here in 769 but Constantine V is a pretty strong guy all right so he manages to maintain the peace but he's gonna live forever so his 769 so now we get oh this is so cute guy dot and tis that's how much he lives he dies at the tis point Kai dot and tis five more years 769 oops one more year after that 769 770 771 772 in the middle there in the red so it's 770 771 772 in the red 773 um, at the on 774 is T's 775 now you could call it 774 here at T's or you could call it at the U of Huming, depending on what kind of fiscal year Mark has in mind. My suspicion is that Mark's fiscal year that he has in mind, okay, is um, running from the sacred year because he's writing on Pesach of 69 AD, but that might not be it. Okay, he might actually be running it on a calendar year or on the Messiah's birthday year. I haven't figured that out. So, you know, one side or the other of 775, we could say that, that Constantine V dies at Tis, or we can say that he dies in the first part of U. Not, uh, not sure which one. Alright. Either way, it's kind of cute. Because if anyone tells you if anyone tells you now tells you what well that's left out if anyone tells you now what has Constantine the fifth been doing all this time he's been like his dad holding back the Arabs okay see right up here 
saving the flesh. He's been holding back the Arabs. He's been trying to get it back to the Bible movement. Accepted. He was an avid reformer, but he holds a council to reason it out. He doesn't just decree all icons be banned. He wants to reason it out. He wants everybody to, to, to think about it and talk about it and agree to it. Okay, now he does get a little sneaky at times. Like, well, a lot sneaky, especially in the 1950s. And he gets really upset with the monks. <laughs> Alright. But, how do I want to put this? He started to go the reasoning way, which is, hi, let's go back to the Bible and not force or just say, I can't worship, I can't worship, I can't worship, I can't worship, since that's not really God. Okay? But, like anybody else, I mean, you know, he has moments where it's like, oh, damn it, we should just get rid of those icons. And so he was mad at certain monks and monasteries for being so stubborn to say no, to still do icon worship. They shouldn't have done it. That's just like, you know, idolatry. All right. And he was really mad about that. So his, his record as far as being reasoning about banning them is on the nice side here because he's holding a council. But a little later on, he's going to get a little nasty and just, like, execute or torture or do really nasty things. And therefore become as evil as the people he's trying to crusade against. That's the problem. When you realize something's wrong and you get mad about it, and I have this problem in spades. <clears throat> when you realize something is wrong and you get mad about it, a lot of time, yeah, you can be reasoning about it and say, well, everybody should have his freedom to say no, but here's why it's bad, like hi highlighted in black now. But when you see the stubbornness and you see it keep on being bad and you see people keep on being, what do you want to call it, apostate, you end up, like, in the anger, reflecting their own stubbornness and apostasy, and you want to, like, hurt them. You want to do something that overrides their volition. So he had that problem. And so did, of course, the people on his side. He had a lot of, they call them iconoclasts. That means to break the icon. They had a lot of them. There were a lot of them that agreed with him. It was politically popular to stop doing the icon worship thing. Well, of course, the people who were still doing the icon worship thing, therefore polarized. And then it got nastier and nastier and nastier between both sides. So this niceness here of holding a council to go through the doctrinal reasons why the icon worship should be banned. First of all, they shouldn't be talking about banning it, but they were. But at least to have a discussion about it. That part was good. Alright, but then when the discussion didn't work, he got crusading. And that was bad. Alright. Even so, is as it were, God's epitaph on him is, and then if someone, you, just the first half of you, someone you, and this is the word says. So if someone says to you, but he, he dies here before saying anything. Of course, you're dead, you're not saying anything. Alright, so it's a sort of neutral or even complimentary epitaph on Constantine V that the, the wording stops here in a nine syllable trinity verse okay I think that's pretty significant now inheriting after him is going to be Leo the fourth and he's the one with the really nasty wife who his dad picked out for him so Constantine picked out a raw the wrong woman for Leo the fourth but he didn't know that at the time. And the historians puzzle over why he picked the gal. Alright? Her name was Irene, and we're going to be seeing a lot about her in a minute. She's a real bitch. Okay, like Pulcheria. One of my two least favorite people in history of these two. She was in the 400s in Western Rome. And he was, she was in, you know, upcoming. So, Leo IV is going to inherit right here at this who 
Tis who? Anyone? To you. Okay. So we're going to cover Leo the Fourth next. So I'm going to get something for my coffee.